This is a business meeting of the North Kingstown School Committee. Today's April 11th. Oh, I'm sorry, what did I say? Let me try that again. April 11th, 2017. I was looking at the 7 o'clock. Uh, and this is a business meeting of the North Kingstown School Committee. Um, and uh, if I could ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mrs. Glasbach? Here. Mrs. Hoskins? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mrs. McLaughlin? Here. Ms. Stevens? Here. Mrs. Shaw? Here. And Mr. Representatives? Here. Uh, and if you could please recite the calendar. Friday, April 14th is Good Friday. All schools are closed. Administrative offices will be open. Monday, April 17th through Friday, April 21st is spring break. All schools closed. Administrative offices will be open. Tuesday, April 25th is a school committee business meeting at 7 p.m. Thank you. Um, so next item that was on our agenda for um, presentations was the e-rate special construction update we're going to have to pull that off for a later meeting because they're still working on that um, other presentations and recognitions yeah we have a few things tonight um, first and uh, foremost i would like to um, congratulate uh, six scouts from troop 22 davisville who are recognized uh, coming up uh, for uh, gaining their eagle scout the eagle court of honor it's called Simon Silling, John Fuller, Sam Fuller, Edwin Goodkin, Xavier Weinberger, and our own John Travis Hunter. Travis, come around in front of the camera there and say hi. <laughs> Good to you, Travis. Um, second on our list uh, tonight, um, I want to. Um, recognize I did this in an email but uh, it's worth doing again um, really great news for Fishing Cove Elementary we've been informed they've been nominated for a blue ribbon um, I did a little research I probably should have done this last time in 2013 um, and I found out some pretty interesting information um, since um, uh, there were 306 public schools in Rhode Island and um, there are only um, 31 of those public schools out of 306 that have received a blue ribbon, and four schools have received the blue ribbon twice. Um, with the 2017 group, there will be a total of 34 public schools in Rhode Island. North Kingstown has four of those schools out of the, out of the 34. Davisville Middle School in 1991, Forest Park in 2005, Stony Lane Elementary in 2013, and Fishing Cove, uh, if that all works out the way it should, in 2017. Um, and in recent, more recent history, that's since 1982, um, since 2012, the current administrative team uh, you see before you, it's all in place at that point, there have been um, 14 in the state, including three from this year. Barrington has three of those, North Kingstown has two. There are seven districts that have one, and no other district has a uh, blue ribbon at the time. So it really speaks well of, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, the long history of uh, really great schools in North Kingstown. So it's a, it's a wonderful um, uh, achievement to get. Uh, there is a lengthy process um, in terms of an application at this point, so it's not done. Very optimistic about it. Um, and you wouldn't have been nominated if you didn't qualify. So, um, so things are looking good, but th there is a lot to go, and we'll probably have an update on this uh, mid to late summer when we find out more from the uh, U.S. Department of Education. So, congratulations to to them. Is that, they say it is an honor just to be nominated. It is an honor just to be nominated, <laughs> and uh, and even a pretty pretty rare item, uh, as I found out. Um, we have some. Um, why don't we go to the business item, and then I'll come back to the music. So we have another recognition yet for our um, business, one of our business programs, and this is the Rhode Island Personal Finance Challenge, uh, the 2017, and North Kingstown came in second place. 
Uh, this were high school students as well as middle school students. Um, they were only 20 points away from being first. Uh, East Greenwich was first place, and then we were second. So um, it's great news. We have um, we have begun the Everfi program that we use at the high school. We've begun that at the middle school now, and we had a student. Uh, who was doing a senior project that um, his name is uh, Evan Urba Urban and he did his uh, senior project part of his project was to uh, uh, assist with some classes after school at one of the middle schools uh, I think that, that one was at uh, Whitman Middle School uh, and so it's a uh, it's great progress and we're proud of them uh, also Rich Garland who has a lot of involvement in our finance uh, financial literacy programs Rich was interviewed by Courtney Hunter of People's Credit Union, and this aired on TV. I don't know if anybody got to see it, uh, but it was a great interview. Uh, started off with Seth, Seth Magazina, and then it went into, um, and then Rich was uh, interviewed, and he spoke very highly, um, uh, represented the district well, um, always very humble about his own accomplishments and contributions. Uh, and uh, he will, the kids will be recognized next next week. It's coming up, um, I think, right after vacation, or maybe right be, no, way before vacation. The, twi the next Thursday, it is, I believe. Um, they are um, going to be recognized uh, for this achievement. Uh, Rich will be away in um, the DECA conference in Anaheim, California. So he's got some kids with him there, uh, and they're competing for the DECA. Into the uh, DECA conference. So, good terms, news. Um, thank you. And in terms of um, recognition also for the high school music program, um, we've just been notified, and this went out last week, um, that the National Association of Music Merchandisers, a huge industry nationwide of professional edu educational music, they recognize North Kingstown as a, um, one of their best communities in music education. We're the only one in Rhode Island to receive that award. And evidence of that, it can be no more clear than um, both our um, symphonic band um, were um, competing in a national competition in Philadelphia this weekend, and they took home first place in that competition. Um, and at the same time, our chorus was competing in New York City in a national competition, and they took home first place in that competition. And a number of our students, including uh, Maisie Cavallo, Cooper Cardone, um, Delaney Schwartzer, um, have um, received you know uh, merits for their personal performances. So, uh, really, truly, uh, uh, one of the best communities for music education in the country. So, uh, congratulations, Dr. Mansiri. <laughs> Dr. Morse is here too. Dr. Morse as well. She's personally responsible for all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and the <laughs> lead chorus singer as well, right? <laughs> and uh, Tony Silvera and Norma Kayaza are, you know, as good as it gets. And uh, they have really affected the lives of so many uh, kids out there. Um, our, our music program is just bustling with uh, involvement. So just another great accomplishment for them. Thank you. Um, so... Next item are citizens' comments. Has anyone signed up to speak? Okay. Yeah, um, That's you know okay. What? Why don't you come on up to the... Uh... So, yeah, so uh, if you could just go to the microphone, it's because it, it does get uh, picked up on the microphone. And um, if you could just please uh, state your name and address. And if you could please limit your uh, time to three minutes, uh, if you could, please. Thank you. My name is Mary Segal. I live at 19 Pheasant Run in Saunders Town. I am here tonight representing my three and a half year old son, JP. Rhode Island general education law states that any child whose birthday is on or before September 1st of the year they turn five legally enters kindergarten. My son's birthday is September 15th. If this law remains in place for this district, then that means he will be left to wait until he is just shy of six years of age to begin kindergarten. If that happens, then I believe his growth and development will be stunted instead of fostered, given that he would be in a classroom filled with children who are significantly younger than him. I have done, I, I'm sorry, I have dug deep 
finding viable research that is both for and against this topic, so I understand that this is not an easy topic to dissect. I, though, ask that you please put what I am about to say into perspective. Title 16-2-25 of Rhode Island Education Law distributes power in Providence and Cranston to legally enable only those two districts to provide early entrance assessments for those children whose birthdays land after September 1st of a child's fifth year. This allows those children to register and begin kindergarten the year they will turn five if they pass. I have copies of Cranston's early entry to kindergarten policy for you tonight. Simply put, Cranston's early entry to kindergarten policy provides parents the option to have their child assessed in the year they turn five if they feel that child is capable. I am here tonight asking for parents in the North Kingstown School District to be legally given the option to have their children assessed for competency slash maturity and therefore prove that they are ready for kindergarten the year they turn five so that children like my son JP whose birthday lands only 14 days after the cutoff, as well as his peers who are up against the same reality, can be given a fair chance to prove readiness for kindergarten. If a child fails the assessment, then they will wait to enter kindergarten until the year they turn six. Research calls this phrase redshirting a child. Conversely, if a parent feels it is best for their child to simply wait until the year they are six, then the parents will not have their child assessed early on. Since October 2016, I have been working with Representative Robert Craven and Senator Mark G to draft and file a legislative bill in support of this enabling request. I also have copies of that for you tonight. It has been filed on the House side, but not yet on the Senate side, as I have been advised by Senator Sheehan, Attorney Christine Marinello, and Education Policy Advisor to the Governor, Arthur Nevins, to present this issue to all North Kingstown School Committee members since you all make or break this bill going forward. I therefore kindly ask that you all please establish a resolution in support of this bill and to put it on the agenda to vote on it. Cranston's early entry policy is tried and true. That in itself is refreshing for a mother like me since it sheds hope for the rest of us who live in a district that is not enabled by law to do the same. I beg you all to please consider my request so it may be implemented into law via legislators for this district. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have copies if you wanted. Could you get on? Um, see like it's like a pass. Bill, the pop in this bill. Okay, I'll make sure they go this. Um, yeah, you can pass that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no one else on the list? No. Anyway, okay, and mm -hmm. if anyone else wants to speak who didn't make it on the list, you're welcome to. Okay, so uh, that would conclude citizens' comments. Um, next item are routine items. Um, first, I'd ask for a motion to seal the executive session minutes of April 11, 2017. So moved. Uh, motion, do I have a second? Second, second sorry. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and I can disclose that no votes were taken in our executive session this evening. Um, for our consent agenda, uh, Mr. Jones had mentioned he would like to exempt item C6. Um, earlier, anyone else have any exemptions from the consent agenda? If there are no others, uh, I would ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item C6. So, second. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Um, Mr. Jones, um, item C6. Yeah, I'd make a motion to approve C6. A motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Um, a discussion. Thank you. Um, I, I noticed on C6, uh, one of the free services was a special education trend analysis. I don't know if does NESDEC provide us that in the past? I don't think so. So since it's noted as one of their free services, can we just I'll I'll part of this approval, that, sure. look into it and see what that constitutes. Okay. And I don't remember seeing that in the data that we get in October or so, but I'll, I'll, we'll look into that. So if um, part of the free service, just make sure they provide whatever that service is. Any further discussion? Okay. 
Hearing none, uh, take a vote. All those in favor of approving item C6? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, next is um, item E, which is the Clark um, High School 8 block schedule memorandum of agreement. Um, the administration has been working very closely with the union in connection with the presentation that we heard recently and reached this memorandum of agreement that's before us for approval. Dr. Hick, want to say a few words about it? Sure. Um, you heard um, from Dr. Mancini at her presentation at our last meeting, so you know a lot of the details of um, what we're looking to do. Obviously, um, some of those uh, items, um, well, all of those items, uh, changing the schedule, have some effect on uh, the teacher's day. Um, so. Um, when we were negotiating our last contract, we wrote into that that we would have a couple of sessions with the faculty and, um, and have an approval from the union on this MOA that you have in front of you. Um, and um, we had some discussions with them just last week um, with our attorney and with our central office team. Uh, Dr. Nasiri was part of that and came up with this MOA that we're all very comfortable with uh, going forward. So your approval will be the last step in the process of uh, making this schedule a reality uh, for September. Uh, any, just, well, first, uh, if I could get a motion to approve the item. So moved. A motion, I have a second. Second. Um, any discussion on this? Okay. I'd just like to say I'd like to thank the administration and the union for your hard work uh, that's gone into uh, both you know, preparing the the schedule and the presentation that we received, as well as uh, you know, everyone working together very nicely uh, in connection with this modification of the contract that you know is necessary to, to put it in place. It's a great example of uh, everyone uh, working together to uh, do something great over the high school. So any other comments? Uh, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving the memorandum of agreement? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Next is item F, which is uh, the approval of charter legislation resolution. Um, to start discussion, could I have a motion to approve that item? A motion to approve. Um, motion and second. Second. And a second. Um, discussion. Mr. Jones. Well, I don't know if Phil wants that first. It up, sure. Uh, um, the um, the resolution is something that was actually sent to us from Narragansett. We basically replicated the, their request, um, and uh, this is an item uh, that is actually one of the items that um, uh, we have a Washington County group that's kind of looking into um, the, our relationship with the local charters and, and what that means for districts. And there'll be more of this coming forward. This item is about having. Um, representation from local communities, um, particularly the most significant local communities for a particular charter school. So in the instance of, say, Kingston Hill or Compass, where North Kingstown has a, a large uh, um, representation there of students who come from our district, um, there would be some kind of uh, official from the North Kingstown School Department or from the North Kingstown School Committee who would uh, um, part of that board uh, with those schools. And we feel that's important since uh, there's currently no representation from local communities, even though a lot of taxpayer money uh, from local communities follows those students to that school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Uh, I just want to add the point of um, you know, the, the larger issue of charter schools aside. Um, just to give sort of an example, um, Kingston Hill recently asked for approval to uh, not take the park exam by the computer-based system, which essentially almost all districts have gone to and, in fact, has been mandated by ride unless you get a waiver. And the reason they cited for a waiver is they are financially unable to provide enough computers at their school to even equip a single classroom. Uh, and so those discussions go on about uh, those kinds of resourcing issues, and yet we send three quarters of a million dollars there, and there was no way we would learn any of this stuff unless we are our own um, 
pursue either watching their minutes or going to their meetings. I think it's important for communities, um, you know, the communication between charter schools and, and the sending districts, but I also think it's important that the sending districts who are sending, in our case, almost a million dollars, at least have some representation to voice concerns, issues, areas for collaboration, areas of concern. Um, it ranges the gamut. But right now, essentially, those dollars go there and there is no accountability back to the sending districts and, more importantly, the sending taxpayers from the uh, community. And at the meeting the other night, it was just one interesting comment. You know, how enrollment can decline and yet the per pupil costs going up. Well, one of the reasons is, uh, you know, our sending a million dollars to charter schools, that revenue goes out, but the costs don't go down correspondingly. And you know, as families, you know, you wait for an empty nest and you send one kid to college, which of course maybe raises your costs. But I mean, it's not like you can necessarily downsize everything else if you still have other children or you still have to heat your house or do all that other stuff. Uh, the same is kind of true when we send one or two students from one or two grades. We are not able to cut a teacher. We are not able to reduce bus routes. We are not able to substantially lower the fixed costs that come with educating one child. And so it's clearly an easy way to explain partially why our per pupil costs can rise, even if we hold all our costs constant. Um, because the costs don't follow that the money does. So I think it's important that, you know, philosophically that taxpayers have representation in as many places as their dollars go to, to have some kind of voice in that. So um, I'm glad to see this resolution go forth, and I hope the General Assembly considers that when we think about charter school reforms. Okay. Any other comments? I'd like to also add, you know, I. I like Mr. Jones have, have made the point that uh, when it, North Kingstown taxpayer money directly from your tax bill goes to the charter schools, just as your tax dollars go to the North Kingstown public schools. Uh, the difference being, uh, the major difference, one of the major differences being that as taxpayers in the town of North Kingstown, you uh, every two slash four years uh, elect each and every one of us. Uh, and if you don't like what we're doing, you are welcome to vote for someone else and reconstitute this board in a way that the of North Kingstown's uh, electors feel are fit. And that is how uh, our democracy works to protect your tax dollars. With respect to the tax dollars from North Kingstown residents that go to the charter schools, um, it's the same money. Uh, the difference is that their board is appointed in a way that has nothing to do with any type of election. Um, they um, don't have anyone that they answer to. Uh, if you are unhappy with the way a charter school is spending its money or what they're doing, um, as a taxpayer in North Kingstown, you have no recourse whatsoever uh, against that board or that school, uh, which is a very different system. And you know, we, uh, just to give an example, sort of similar to what Mr. Jones was saying, um, the residents of the town of Jamestown uh, send a significant portion of their tax dollars to the North Kingstown School Department uh, because they've you know, sent their children to our high school to be educated. And as a result, sitting right here is a representative from the town of Jamestown. Uh, and uh, they are here and they take an active part in our meetings. And I think that's an important part of the collaboration. Um, that doesn't exist uh, when it comes to the charter school system. And uh, I think that's a problem. And that's why I support this. Any uh, other comments? Uh, hearing none, there's a motion and a second on the table. Uh, all those in favor of approving the resolution? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next, unfinished business. Uh, anything on the 2016-17 school budget? No. Anything on the 2017-2018 school budget? Yes. Dr. Dr. Humbert and I would like to um, just speak a little bit about some of the assumptions that were brought forward last night at the, the public budget hearing. Dr. Humbert, you want to talk about the stunning lady? Before you look, just say one thing before you start. Um, for those who might not know, um, last evening uh, was the North Kingstown um, Town Council and, and town in general public um, hearings on the 2017-2018 budget, and uh, that I believe should be available to stream uh, off the town of North Kingstown website if you'd like to see. And uh, some people had some comments that I know you wanted to respond to. So, yes, so I just wanted to. Um, 
provide a little bit of clarification because it, it could be um, there could be a misconception that the level of proficiency decreased dramatically um, by uh, from the year 2014 to the year 2015. And I want to make it clear that we had two different types of measurements. Um, we have had uh, the NECAP assessment as our state assessment, and I have uh, been providing uh, trend lines for NECAP for several years, um, going all the way back to 2007-2008 school year. Um, and we have been able to see those trend lines. It's very, very critical when you are looking at assessment data that you look at trend lines. You cannot just go from one year to another year. Now we shift, shifted, as everybody knows, uh, in 2015 we shifted to the park test. That is a new baseline of data. And uh, that, we have said that over and over again, made that perfectly clear, that when we started in 2015, that was baseline data. We now have two years of data, and even with that, it's caution that we look at the uh, comparison from one year to the other. We do not even have a trend yet for PARC. So to then take the kneecap data, data that we have and compare the kneecap data to the POC data and make any assumptions from that is uh, totally mm -hmm. irresponsible and confusing to people. So just want to be clear, when we had a two-year trend, and I even am very hesitant to even, even make comparisons with the two-year trend, but overall as a district, uh, we saw a little bit of decline um, from 2015-2016 in our uh, ELA scores, but we saw an increase in our math scores. Um, we had differences with the um, school that was, was mentioned uh, last night was Stony Lane. Um, Stone, Stony Lane had a 10% drop in ELA, but they had a 10% gain in math. And so, in, in being that it's only one year to another, as I said, it's not a trend yet. So, um, there was a lot of uh, emphasis put on uh, math efforts last year. Um, that could have been a, a factor, but it's really anybody's guess until we can see how this test um, uh, measures and how we're responding with our um, instruction and our curriculum being aligned to it. So it's really premature to make assumptions at this point, and it's even more confusing when two different assessment data are compared. And, and to follow up on that, um, I have a document in front of the members of the committee. This, this, uh, the top part was a document that was actually handed to the town council members last night, I noticed, but not the school committee members. Um, the bottom uh, graph or chart is something that I put together, and um, the top seems to suggest that, as Dr. Humbert just mentioned, that the difference in the test was a, a, an apples to apples comparison. It, it not and, and not a very responsible way of handling this. What, what I've tried to do is to show that the relationship of Stony Lane to the state score for grades three, four, and five, which are the grades that are tested, um, is pretty much the same. Um, in 2014, when we ended the NECAP, and that was the 13, 14 year that um, Stony Lane won the blue ribbon, um, to now it's, it's roughly the same. It's, about 1.28 relationship, meaning that um, take you know the the state score and we're 0.28 better than that um, at Stony Lane, and um, that has gone to 0.23 for ELA, but we were about 1.47 in 14 for um, math, and now we're at 1.49. So that roughly suggests that we're about 50% better scores uh, for Stony Lane in ELA and about 25% better scores in, in um, 50 percent better in math, 25% better in ELA. But that that relationship has pretty much stayed the same from the end of the kneecap years to the park years. So that variable has not changed. The test has changed, the numbers look different, but that variable has not changed. So 
And as Dr. Humber said, there, we, we haven't seen more years to really get a sense for sure about you know, how things are going. When we get test data back, we scour through it more than anybody. And what we always want to know is, you know, what do we need to do to get back? And, and that is a constant, and, and I assure you that that is going on at Stony Lane, and that is going on at all the schools in the Montana School Department. And um, just recently, in the past six or seven years, the past five years of NECAP, we were one of six districts in the state that have improved at every level on every test. Uh, one of only six districts in Rhode Island to do that. So we have a good track record of learning from the data that we're getting and making improvements, and we expect to continue to do that with, with these schools. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Just to make sure that I understand this. So, Right now, we're saying that Stony Lane is at 47.1% proficiency in reading. Is that right? That's on the park test, yes. Okay, so that's a 10% decrease over last year. Like yes. So, it was 57.8 in 2014 15, it's 47.1. So, so it's a 10% so so in, in uh, proficiency right. decrease which is about 20% of that number of the 57%. And that's actually what, so it's less than one in two students is proficient in ELA and we're satisfied with that? I'm not saying that we're necessarily satisfied with any one of these numbers. Uh, one of the highest numbers in NK is 72. I'm not satisfied with that. So what are we doing about that? We're doing, we're doing a lot of things. That's what school improvement teams are for. And they review, as I just mentioned, we review that data and we find out sometimes, you know, every time, kid by kid, what what are they uh, showing us that they know and what don't they know and what are we going to do about it? I mean, I don't think the point last night was that compare scores to scores, there's right now, as we <coughs> mean, less than one per two children is proficient in early learning, and that's, that's an issue. I mean, that should trump a lot of other things that are going on right now, and I don't know that that we're doing enough um, as a school committee and as an administration team to address that. You have to understand, though, that this this test is aligned to the Common Core. This test is a much, much more rigorous test than the NECAP test was, and we are fifth highest in the in the whole state. So everybody is in this is in the same. Bolding. But I think, just as a comment as well, that the person who made the comment was trying to show that the schools that have more aids or, I mean, this was her point last night. But even the even, that, even the that, though, um, Jen falls, falls through because, you know, we have a lot of resources poured into um, several of the schools. You know, we saw gains in uh, looking at, you know, Fishing Cove. Uh, we saw gains in ELA and math. Um, Forest Park, we saw gains in ELA and math. But you're still looking at just two years of data. Right. Um, you know, Hamilton, we saw we saw a decrease in ELA, but we saw an increase in math. You know, so I don't think there's anything that you can conclude that extra resources such as teaching assistants is is the cause. I mean, there's, we we have no evidence. Of, of these, and, and we really honestly don't have a handle yet on why these are fluctuating the way they are. You know, and sometimes it's, when you look at schools particularly, it's, it can be really cohort-based. You know, it's, it can be a grade level that, um, you know, and so if you're looking at 40 students in these smaller schools, I mean, I, I know Stony Lane is, is larger, but still, it, it, when, as far as data is concerned, those are small, there's a margin of error, is huge um, for, the, for these. So you have to be really cautious um, in looking at it. And even I caution the principals when they're looking at their data, when they're looking at grade level data, they need to be very careful too, because you're looking at small groups. Um, and you can't draw a lot of conclusions. You know, what you can do is look at the, look at the items where the students um, did not perform well and see if there's a gap in the instruction. So that we, that's a lot that we do. We just finished doing a whole analysis this year of, of the evidence statements that are, break down the um, Common Core standards um, into all various components. And then we look to see where the weak areas were. Um, so 
that analysis is, is ongoing. Uh, and when we did it with kneecap, you know, we just kept seeing the trend going up and up and up. I have, I have um, seven, uh, seven years of data here with kneecap. Um, and except for the schools that, that don't have data in the first three years because of the configurations, they didn't have fourth and fifth grade. But other than that, we have data for all of the um, school, the other schools, um, and, and everybody has data from 2010. Um, and when you, when you start to see that trend, you will see still fluctuations even with that, but it's overall an upward trend. So it's, I mean, it, you have to be just very careful with with data analysis and drawing conclusions. Yes, that's all. Yeah, and then we have student too. Excuse me, isn't ELA English language arts? Yes. What do they test for when they're, when they're... So that includes reading and writing. Right. And um, with, with NECAP, we had writing, writing was a separate test, but with PARC, it's integrated. So it's one test that, that has reading and writing. Right. What grades are testing? Mm -hmm. um, te three, four, and five. Yeah. Wait, we said we're testing from grades three, yeah, three through eight, uh, ninth grade in the high school this year for ELA, and math is three through uh, eight, and then by content area. And then, uh, let's do um, I'm not sure the correlates to all, but when I took the ELA test for part last year or two years ago. Um, a lot of my friends that were in honors and AP English classes felt kind of iffy about the English test. So I'm not too sure if like a low proficiency on the test for a school really shows the school's overall proficiency in that area, because I do feel as though it was a pretty hard test, at least for LA. Yeah, they, yeah, they, um, high school was a, was a, 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 a whole nother issue. Um, and that analysis of that data showed that there were many AP students who performed um, more, uh, performed poorly in comparison to students who were not in AP classes. So you don't know if that's a matter of uh, taking the, the test seriously or not, um, the effort that was put in, the motivation, and we also had very low participation rates at the high school level, which really, um, uh, makes the results um, doubtful. I mean, they, they, we can't conclude anything with a low participation. It's just it's not valid data. Now the high school is moving to the SAT, so that is definitely improved. People see the, the merit in taking the SAT, SAT and understand that that has a meaning for them that will help them in college. So, um, I do agree with James and Dr. Humberg, and definitely there's a lot of stuff when I took the part. Most of the ELA test was stuff that we really hadn't learned. Not so much hadn't learned, but things we hadn't done before. So um, probably it's less of, a, uh, less of an issue for the elementary schoolers, but they didn't start to learn the stuff with the Common Core. It only got implemented in the last couple of years. So I think part of the problem is that, as you see with the high schoolers, too, the lack of motivation, but also part of it, the test is so new and the standards are so new that we don't necessarily we haven't been taught, we haven't done as much of that yet. So that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought it up because I had, I had forgotten to even mention that. So when the Common Core standards were developed, there was a shift, a lot of shift, in what content was covered in various grade levels. So as a result, that created gaps because now something that might have been covered in one grade level is now being covered in another. And students, we were playing catch up for a couple of years to try to get everybody up to the content that is now going to be in their grade level. So um, so we were doubling up on instruction on some things just to get people so that they would get caught up. And that does take time for that to happen. So that's a, that's a very, very good point. Were there, were there many families in the elementary level that chose to opt to have their child not take the test? Did you have that? No, we met participation rates at the elementary level. So yeah. all, all of the elementary schools met the 95% percent, percent of the rate of, of participation. Um, yeah, the, um, the second, last year, the last year that we took it, the middle school made it. I'm not sure about the first year. I think we might have been a little the first lower. first year, the park was new and there was a lot of protests uh, around the state. We weren't the only one. 
Um, the one other point I want to clarify is there's also that was provided for us last night um, a rough chart on different schools and the number of students they have and the number of staff. And I think it's important to provide some context here. Um, Stony Lane is uh, a school that does not have um, a special um, kind of special education program um, at that school. Um, Fishing Cove has the preschool that is very um, uh, you know, staff heavy because uh, it's so special ed based. So there are a lot of adults in those rooms. Goodness, it has the title issue going on, so they have some staff that are afforded to them through title and a mandate to get those funds that you need to provide smaller class sizes than the rest of the district um, to have it that way. Those are the laws we work by. Hamilton has a special education program that is um, staff intensive. Forest Park has a special education program that is staff intensive. So, so is the high school. Those are the ones that are provided as a, as a point of comparison. Stony Lane does not. Why does so that? It's just years of you know where things were placed. For instance, um, I was mentioning earlier tonight that when we did the uh, the reorganization of schools back in 2000. Um, going from schools that were four and five and K and three, and we went to from six elementary schools to five. It was a large contingent from the Lafayette Road area that had uh, Dr. Thornton, the superintendent at the time, and he had um, partitioned out the town so that Lafayette Road was part of Fishing Cove. Um, the residents of that road all banded together and as a group. And this was about 50 or 60 kids infected now, um, petitioned the school committee to go to Stony Lane instead of Fishing Cove. So um, when that happened, Dr. Thornton did not recommend it, but um, the school committee still approved it, and knowing that Stony Lane would, at the time, have about 95% capacity, where that would make Fishing Cove, because all these kids were going to go to Fishing Cove, now Fishing Cove is going to be at 50% capacity. So um, at the time, uh, Rachel Santa was the special education director, and she proposed to have all of the preschool take place at Fishing Cove because that's where the room was now. 50% of the, of the building was available. Um, so uh, that ended up being there um, before Davisville Academy. The behavioral program um, for elementary was at Fishing Cove, or at least part of it. Um, so a lot of it is, is basically just kind of where the room is. Um, Forest Park, for instance, had the Next Steps program. Um, Forest Park right now is absolutely filled with two classrooms per grade, um, and, and they have the LEAP program there. That takes up their whole space, whereas Hamilton has room available to take the Next Steps program that used to be at Forest Park. So they really didn't have that room because they were at 95% capacity. So it, it's not a matter of choosing one neighborhood because we like one neighborhood more than the other. It's just this is where the room is to be able to do this in the district. So Hamilton has some special ed programming. Forest Park does. Um, Quidnessa has a lot of the title, um, all of the title. And, um, and you know, at uh, Fishing Cove, there is the preschool, which takes up a large chunk of that building. It's one of the biggest preschool programs in the state of Rhode Island. Some questions on that item. Uh, moving on to CIP, mm -hmm. existing bond, and future bonds. Um, one thing I just want to mention with respect to future bonds uh, in particular is that uh, this Thursday evening at is it six, or six? Yeah, six, o six o'clock, the town council is having their own meeting to discuss uh, potential town bonding that uh, could potentially um, include a school component. Uh, so a bit of discussion, uh, at least on the town council side, will occur uh, at that meeting as well. Um, our item here is uh, approval of a &E fee fees, rather, with respect to our um, asset protection plan. This is Kim Buehler, uh, just mention what this is about. Right. Uh, RIDE requires that every district have a five-year asset protection plan, regardless of whether or not you're going to be asking for housing aid. However, the housing aid piece it morphs out of that five-year asset protection plan. Our five-year asset protection plan, um, it requires a phase one, phase two. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody talk about that before, facilities assessment. 
it's very involved and the regulations have changed. You need structural analysis, you need cost estimates, you need mechanicals and electricals to be reviewed. So it's not just a matter of us putting in, we want to do ABC projects. The entire district needs to be reviewed, structural analysis, cost estimates. And then when it's brought forward to ride, they'll review the entire package in the event that you want to do some, how you want to get housing aid. Housing aid could be up to 40% <coughs> of your project, so it's a significant amount of money that we could gain. Um, the timing of this is pretty good if we do go out to bond because we, clearly we'd be looking for housing aid to maximize our dollars. Um, the important thing to keep in mind though is that that five-year asset protection plan is required even if you're not going to be doing anything. So one of the new rules is that when you put forward uh, this protection plan, you need to commit to doing 50% of whatever work you put forward. So it's no longer like it used to be where districts would say, my district needs $50 million worth of work. You know, we believe in all of our schools. You would now have to commit over a five-year period to doing 50% of that. So we, it's a little bit trickier of a, of a submittal now that you have to be able to commit or be able to commit to doing 50%. You need to show a funding stream, whether that be bonding or general funds or fund balance. So there are a lot of new rules and regulations. Um, the first part of the uh, document is, is generally some basic information about the district. It's quite a bit of information about the district. We're required to have a building committee, which will be an offshoot of our facilities subcommittee. Well, there are certain um, ride requirements about what types of individuals you need included on that. Uh, and then the details about the schools. So our, uh, the proposal is that we, um, we do need the architectural engineering fees, um, consulting fees to go with that. Um, Edward Rouse Associates, Mr. Partridge, has been with the district for more than 10 years. He's, he was here well before I was here. He's done work well with the town uh, and the school department. And his subcontractors would be your electrical contractors, your mechanical contractors, the cost estimates, and the structural analysis. Um, Edward Rouse Architects Company is on the state MPA uh, for these services. As such, they are capped at how much they are able to charge. Uh, and the state has fully vetted that process. Um, this could take probably up to a year to complete this analysis. It's not. He will work in conjunction with some other reports we have, and also his historical knowledge of the district is, is very, very valuable. Uh, Dr. Roger and I went and met with a couple of districts who have been through uh, major bonding, um, building new schools and whatnot, and uh, their big item was that you really need to hire somebody that you have worked with, that you trust, someone if, if possible that really knows your district well. Uh, it was one of the things that a couple of the districts struggled with um, because <coughs> there's a big learning curve in the district. I could pass for motion to approve for discussion purposes. We had a tie. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay, motion. Second. Uh, any comments or discussion on this item? Um, I could just the agenda item as a whole is slightly larger, so maybe talk about C and not hold up one. Okay. Oh, well, we have a motion right now on right. number so, one. Right. So you're okay with number one? We'll yeah. talk more yeah. about yes. In Much general. larger. Okay. Right. So, uh, any yes. So, I am really waffling about this whole issue because it is difficult for me, being the one who's always pushing for bids and RFPs, uh, to to issue a contract for this amount of money. However. Um, because they're on the MPA, because they did respond to a bid, because they do have the history and so much of what has to go into the document is based on the history of their knowledge of all the schools because, yes, things change but very slowly. So they would be able to get into the knot of all of our schools and issue that structural report on the needs of all the schools more quickly and then focus on what we need going forward. Um, I would be in favor of the facility subcommittee has worked very well with Mr. Partridge. He would be our contact. Uh, Ride, he's worked closely with Ride. Ride re would require 
even if we're not asking for housing aid, any projects of a value of over $500,000 still need right approval. So even if they're not kicking in the housing aid piece, they're very familiar with them. Um, and and Ms. McGovern, Mrs. McGovern is on our facility subcommittee, so she knows how well uh, he's worked with the district and for the district. So I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I would concur. I mean, you know, we appreciate the effort you know, <laughs> over what you do, you know, because we're all busy that we sometimes take different pieces yeah, different and that you, you you look at this. But that was the same concern I had, and, you know, the fact that we're on the MPA, I think, um, you know, and caps it and stuff, and then all the other things you mentioned, um, I think it's important. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving C1? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, other discussion on? Uh, it was. Um, um, this discussion just they had briefly with the superintendent to raise, you know, to the larger thing, and it's, it's easy for me to impose on your time. <laughs> I, I, I just it, uh, encourage the superintendent working with um, leadership team um, that we've been, you know, we we looked at some options. This is the next step forward. Um, I think two things. I think one is we, we we keep narrowing this. We need to go forward with you know some kind of general correspondence at your level, with your counterpart and superintendent of the town manager to sort of say, you know, as we've gone from this sort of few different options to sort of settling on, this is looking the most promising that that we at least get the town council aware of your. You're becoming more focused, and that has implications, for example, of certain school buildings potentially, and that they need to at least be, if not an agenda item, and maybe it will come up Thursday. Um, <laughs> it's the idea. But, but, you know, at least sort of keeping them on notice that, that we're in a time frame to convert this from options to specifics action. to action. And so um, they'll be the council, hopefully, that, you know, is on at least through November 2018. So the earlier we, they keep bringing it to their attention, not asking for obviously a vote at this time, but but they keep understanding more refinement of, of where we're headed and obviously the implications for potentially things like the government center or, or where we're headed with that um, is one issue. Um, the second thing I talked to the superintendent about was, you know, when we compete at the state level, you know, we're sort of looked at as as the lesser needs of, of potentially other districts, given where we're at. Um, it, it may be useful for us, um, the superintendent, and Ms. King, and maybe one or two of us might be Sheila at the time, I think you, um, to, to go to ride and at least sort of pitch what we're doing. Um, at a minimum, just to put on the radar screen that some of the things we're doing maybe fits in with a larger agenda of consolidating or reducing um, or potentially being a test pilot if we're building a new building to, to get rides. Um, working with them on maybe some innovative teaching and learning stuff that we could pilot with the new building. So I, I think just getting it on rides radar screen as opposed to just one of 39 submissions may be worth an hour of time at some point. Superintendent could arrange that, and maybe if, you know one or two of us have the time to, to sort of go along with it there. Um, the third piece, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> no, 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 it's not that. No. So we wanted to speak. We really only have during citizens' comments. So, um, <laughs> oh, uh, well, to oh. clarify, I mean, well, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we so we we put out for the Nasdaq study. You know, and as part of this, the school committee's goal with the superintendent um, to have a longer term capital infrastructure plan for the district. Um, and clearly, one of the options was building a new building, potentially closing some, you know, moving the pieces around a little um, to sort of take advantage of where enrollments are headed and the age of our buildings. And, and I think the common sense approach that it doesn't make sense to keep putting money into buildings that eventually we don't see as part of our long-term future. I mean, obviously we, we need to do what we need to do to make sure that the children, the students, and the staff, and, and everyone are, are protected and, and safe environment, and et cetera. But it doesn't make sense 
um, to go forward with a lot of stuff if we have a longer term vision. And I think most people understand that. You don't sort of put money into stuff if you've got a vision of where you want to go. You prefer to sort of go where you're going as quick as you can on that aspect. Um, and in line with that, I know we put some money, in, and obviously with, with the help of, of the booster clubs, who, who's obviously been, been great supporters of, of NK athletics, obviously, and co-curricular activities, um, are we ready to bring forth the, the work from our, our folks who are looking at our high school complex? Bring forth as a in terms of actually paying for it? Uh, bring forth as in terms of whatever we had asked them to study and were going to present to us? Um, they did present. They did presented. Um, they actually, it was a presentation. Ah, <laughs> there you go. No, I, I, I so. think he was a I, think he I, I, I saw the one. Yeah. yeah, I saw the one, but I thought we were. Well, then maybe I should just ask where we're at with that. Yeah. The more appropriate. Right. right. With them and yeah. the high school. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So I just maybe more where we're, where we're at in terms of the next. Well, steps. we're not really. We're not really anywhere, to be honest with you, because there's still that large component of funding that we would have to come up with. I mean, you know, the, the discussion was a third, a third, and a third, kind of. We have not approached the town about their third, but we kind of have to come up with our third. And, and the proposal was 2 to $2.3 million if we were doing the entire complex, with the discussion that if we're not doing the entire complex, we do have to talk about doing the track and the tennis courts. Now, I have asked my facilities supervisor to put the tennis courts out to bid um, so that we can at least look at that. Um, the numbers are big. We're, we're looking at probably $50,000 a court at this point. Um, but we're, we're kind of, we're at the point where we've got the numbers. The entire complex is about $2.3 million coming up with $700,000 for our side and, you know, Assuming the, the other two thirds are there. Right. The, right. the boosters said the, they would fundraise, but. The, and the conversations we've had with Mr. Mollis as well have been, well, let's start talking about this bond and maybe that gets all absorbed into that piece. So, you know, it's great that we're talking about the bond in long term, um, but that means it puts a lot of things on hold because it might end up getting included in that, you know. So we're. It's really good that we're having this conversation Thursday night, and hopefully with the town council we can start getting a sense of direction about you know, what's doable and, and, and we can you know, put everything on the table. Right, so I guess, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, so I guess my point is simply, were there no sort of sticky issues that came out? So resourcing aside, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, but if we magically had 2.3 million would we be ready to go forward? Mr. Medoyan oh, has yeah. in his back pocket right now. <laughs> yeah, and what but we I mean, you know, the wetlands or any, you know, any Well, that's that. just further work that would need to be done. So okay. when we had presented uh, PAR engineering, they had right. phases right. to their consulting services, so that would be the next phase. So, you know, I can't tell you that there isn't something out there that they wouldn't find, but those would be the next phases that they would go into, uh, working with DEM and, and all of that, whatever our plan happened to be. And it included you know, when we moved this here, I mean, there was, there was yeah. some. Right, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, that, that sort of tackle the money issue, but we're, once we solve that, we're, we're ready to. We, yeah, we would be. Forward. You know, I, I mean, there are a couple of the decisions that you would need to make. You would need to make, you know, as I recall, the presentation was um, there were uh, one option was 2 million, 2.1 million. If you had a higher level of turf, a higher grade of turf, or a higher, I think it was cushioning of turf, that was 2.3 million. And then the question of turf or no turf. Exactly, the type of turf, all of that. So those are kind of, would be your sticky decisions to make, um, but certainly not something that you can't overcome or, or we can't figure out with data presented to you. Mr. Haig has lots of data on that. He has lots of information on that. He's mentioned that at a few of the meetings. Um, but those would be the next steps at which point we could move forward monetarily. The thing is, we shouldn't be putting things off until the bond, and we can't just celebrate, like, yay, everything's new because of the bond, and watch it deteriorate over the life of the bond until we have junk again. We right. need to be putting 
capital money in every year for repairs and maintenance of what we have. You're right. And you know, a bond should only be for the big things like a new school or uh, you know, even the town side. If if there was truly a CIP, town hall wouldn't have gotten that bad. The roads wouldn't get that bad. That every there has to be a constant investment, even yeah. in the athletic facilities. We should have had capital and I don't money to. I haven't heard a discussion on how that's going to be tackled, and, and that is, you know, for the whole time that we've, you know, been doing this, there's a backlog of work that the town and the schools need to have done, but as we keep moving year after year after year, stuff is getting older and older and older. That discussion, I have not heard. There has so in addition to the bond money, there should be there some has level to be, of There has investment. to be, there needs to be a plan. And you know, there, there's a town committee I thought was coming up with that plan. I really haven't heard anything about that. So maybe we'll hear some discussion about that on Thursday night, but you're right. Uh, and I would think that that would be important for people to understand that before we continue to move forward. And I was having a conversation with someone just a few days ago who basically said, well, you know, if we do this bond, then we can you know, take a big whack at the school's capital improvement plan, get rid of the big ticket items, and I basically made the exact point that you made, which is, yeah, okay, that, that's wonderful. You know, let's say that the funds are available to take a big piece out of our capital improvement plan. You've solved one problem, but you haven't solved the problem. Uh, and the problem is that both the town and the school side, and, you know, all of our money comes from the town, so we can't do this without the support of the town council, needs to have a sustained, funded capital improvement plan. Because there are two ways, essentially, to raise money for capital improvements like this. And, and to be more specific for people watching at home or whatever, there's the operating costs, things that we do every year. We pay for teachers every year. We pay for salaries. We pay for buses. We all the things, you know, I mean, physically driving buses around. These things happen every year. But then there are the things that don't happen every year. A roof here needs to be replaced. A boiler there needs to be replaced. The track needs to be resurfaced. It needs to be maintained. All of these things that happen over time, they need to be funded. You can either put money aside that is sufficient to handle those things as you go along, which is the responsible way to handle it, or you can bond it, which means you're borrowing the money. And when you're borrowing the money, you get a whole lot of money all at once, and then you pay for it over time. The right answer is a combination of the two. You can't do it all with just saving. And you shouldn't do it all with just borrowing. And so I'm just concerned. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, if there is a bond and the bond is approved and, you know, a, an influx of money comes in to get some of these projects done, you've solved the problem right now. But let's say we put it in a track, okay? We get bond money, we put it in a track. Day one, great, we have a brand new track. Well, great. Well, five years later, it will need to have some maintenance done. And if you haven't put one fifth of that amount away, You've solved nothing, because then five years later it doesn't get fixed, and then ten years later it doesn't get fixed, and then because you didn't do the maintenance, now it needs to get replaced again. And that is where, you know, I think that the town of North Kingstown as a whole has been very poor with long-term planning. And I think that now is the time to really get together with the council. I mean, I'm hoping, that I'm planning on mentioning this to the extent I'm able to tomorrow night, uh, sorry, Thursday night, um, it has to be part of the equation because just borrowing all the money without any plan of what to do next is very short-sighted, and I think we need to be better than that. Well, and our CIP outlines projects that are way out, so if this took care of the big ticket items, we'll never get to those. Correct. Uh, next, the, the next tier. Um, it's really... And know. there's things I, I know need, need to be done that aren't even on that list. When was the last time we repaved Davisville Middle School parking lot? You're, well, you know, there is some, some parking on there, but you're right. I mean, there's, there's all of that stuff. Um, the and playgrounds and all of that. You know it's going to have to be done. You know, we, we paved, you know, just make that forest park to playground. Okay, great. But that won't last forever. It's going to need to be done again. So what's the plan to just have that money? So I, mean, I, think, I think the whole equation, looking at this monumental decision we're about to make, needs to be driven by a sense of vision. Right now, we have one of our middle schools that's 86 years plus. And every time we talk about putting any money into it, it's why would we put more money into that? I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like it's there for the long term. It, 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 is, it is something that needs to be either totally repurposed, uh, revamped, or, um, or replaced. Um, and we have.
have two elementary schools that do not have a gymnasium, um, and both of them are two of the older elementary schools that we have. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the district that we want to have for the long term, um, we've talked about this many times around the table, it would be nice if we could do this with fewer elementary schools that are newer and more efficient. Um, it would help if we could have, uh, like we have one high school, it would help if we had one middle school that was very new and efficient, and, um, and wouldn't it be nice if that middle school happened to be near the high school so then we could take care of busing these to both of those schools together, which would help on all the bus times and it would have an effect on, you know, Entries in the middle schools as well, in terms of getting more favorable start times, we could handle that issue. Um, we could save on you know, administrative costs, we could save on heating costs. There's all kinds of things that we could do, and we could just be leaner and more efficient in so many different ways. Um, and that all makes a lot of sense. And I think you know we need to be mindful of that vision when we go into these talks. Um, and I think if people kind of keep their eyes on the prize in that respect, um, it it helps. You know, it doesn't become, well, we got some money, what can we do with it? It's, we want to get here. So how do we make this bonding and, and this year-to-year -year planning for capital something that we have that kind of structure that we, we hope to get, and it's something that is well-maintained year after year. So it doesn't turn into another town hall. There's no better metaphor than the town hall in NK for this kind of thinking. For years and years, it's been something that repairs have been delayed, maintenance has been delayed, and they were forced to close it down. So we don't want that happening with school buildings, obviously. So, But I, I also don't want to, you know, if, if we all agreed right now that we were going to build one middle school and all of this other vision, it would probably take us seven to ten years to get that right. done. I don't want anybody to think that that means that an old school that we have or, or any thoughts that anybody might have of shutting down elementary schools that we can just defer that because we're not even, we haven't even come close to any discussion about that so we can't not do work right now to those places that people might think should go away we have to we have to we have to look forward to saying you know that plan is not what works right now it would be a great plan to have but we can't keep kicking the can down the road on those buildings anymore that's my concern that that becomes a deflection on, on what some items are that need to be done. We can't wait that long. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is a fun question. Uh, any other discussion on the CIP plan, existing bond, or future? Uh, we didn't have any other new business. Uh, there are two reports in your packet, uh, disposal notification. Any questions or comments on that? And also our financial reports are in there. I have uh, a discussion on them. Uh, I've pointed out to members of the public before, you know, in the interest of transparency, uh, you'll see in this uh, week's minutes, as well as on a regular basis, an itemization of essentially, with the exception of personal payroll checks, the entire check register of the North Kingstown School Department, organized in descending order from amount and also alphabetically, uh, as well as our latest budget report. So you're welcome to peruse those at your leisure uh, and uh, comment if need be. Uh, Mrs. King's always available for questions if you have any. Um, we'll link that to mm -hmm. um, the report. Includes financials. Yeah, we, we, uh, it's coming. The, we have an annual report uh, that we've been put out year to year. I'm very excited about this year's edition. Um, it is um, better than ever. And um, it is at the printers as we speak. Uh, we plan on having uh, a hard copy of that report go to every household in North Kingstown and in Jamestown. And um, um, we, once once it's on the way out, hard copy, I'll also send it out electronically so people can see it that way as well. And um, like I said, very excited. I think people will find it very informative uh, to know, uh, you know a lot of the information that we store in that. Partially celebratory in terms of we celebrate the good things that are going on in the district, but a lot of it is just purely informative about our budget and um, uh, the, the demographics of the district and, and um, you know, a lot of other details that people may not have thought of. Uh, so it helps to keep the public informed about your school system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
And that is all. We have reached the end of our agenda. I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Another tie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By a hair to Ms. Hosky and a second for Mr. Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.